Amlan, it's great to get you on Real Vision. You and I used to see each other a lot when I was at GLG, and you were my go-to guy, the, the only guy who understood demographics, and you were very, very influential in my thinking back then. And we've kind of loosely kept in touch over time, and I just you know, thank you for coming here. I'd love for you, A, to talk about what you do now, um, and just a little bit about yourself, you know, um, the, the, the whole story of, of, of how you got to where you are, and then we'll dig in a bit about your philosophy of demographics and how you look at the world. Thanks a lot, Raul. It's a pleasure seeing you after many, many years, you and Sunny Kamen, me in a room in London while the weather out there doesn't look as bleak as it does 350 days of the year. <laughs> We're close to 30 degrees. Maybe the setting and the gods have listened to us. <laughs> a lot of my life and career has been a series of, I would say, unplanned incidents and veering down different tracks. So I left academia in 1998 to join Credit Suisse and build emerging markets, risk models for them, and also to advise Bank of England at that time because Asian crisis was going on. So my EM and academic background suited at that time. And uh, those models were also very important because Credit Suisse lost a lot of money in Russia. So I did that for about four or five years. And then in uh, parallel in 2000, somebody wanted me to go up a deep end and a dead end of trying to think about something called demographics. I'd never heard the term before. My father was a cardiologist. I knew what it broadly was. And they asked me for a business plan. And my answer was, I will link demographics to things that I know something about. Asset prices and growth, having taught them at universities across three continents, I can say, why do some countries grow faster than others? Why are some assets more attractive than the others? Why do we see yields and spreads at certain levels? So that was my mission, but I didn't know what I was getting into. And then somewhere in 2000, we wrote the opening report that you knew demographic manifesto, which was to policymakers in Japan, Italy, Germany, and the oldest countries, that a mix of four policies will enable countries like Japan, Italy, Germany, Switzerland, which had a mass of old people to be supported by a shrinking mass of young people, deal with the so-called demographics time bomb or rapidly aging populations and the four pronged uh, manifesto. And we called it the demographic manifesto because it was radical like the communist manifesto, talked about a four pronged approach. Number one, flexible enabled retirement and abolishing retirement age. So the first three words in the manifesto were abolish retirement ages. There are charts in the manifesto which go back a million years. So we were ahead of our times. The second one was increased female labor force participation. We are unfair in this world. Women outlive men. In the G10, women have more university degrees uh, relative to men. Yet on average in the G10, we pay women about 14% less than men. We also afford them 30%. Um, uh, uh, we offer them 14% less jobs and pay them about 30% less. And this is not adjusting for skills. We argued in a paper written recently, a couple of years ago, that if gender equality were to persist and we were to make it more of a norm, then growth in the world would increase, um, income inequality would go down, sustainability would do better, and debt would go down. All these four are problems for most advanced countries of the world, and also in a sub-segment for the developing countries of the world. Sorry for interrupting your video, but I have a very important message to share. At Real Vision, we pride ourselves on providing the very best in-depth expert analysis available to help you understand the complex world of finance, business, and the global economy. So if you like what you see on the Real Vision YouTube channel, that's just the tip of the iceberg. You should come to realvision.com and see how we're not leaving any stone unturned from publishing more in-depth videos, live discussions, written reports, and our latest feature, The Exchange, where you get a chance to engage with experts, fellow subscribers, and learn from everyone's experience, which can't be wrapped in a video. It's an experience which you live and learn from. So if you go to the link in the description or go to realvision.com, it costs you just $1. I don't think it's something you could afford to be without. Debt would go down. All these four are problems for most advanced countries of the world and also in a sub-segment for the developing countries of the world.
The third point was selective immigration and very controversial. I did laugh at the US for taking in lots of immigrants without asking kind of questions. Same with the UK, same with Switzerland, Netherlands. And my criticism at that time of the Department of Labor was every country should do different things on immigration, should ask the question, how many immigrants do we need with skills? What are the costs and how do we deal with it? None of the countries in 2000 asked those questions except for two countries that I gave a C on immigration and those two countries were Australia and Canada. As part of my advisory over two decades, I put the uh, US government in touch with the Australians and the Canadian government in touch with the Swedes because both Sweden and US could take lessons from those two countries because skills, different countries over the skill cycle have different shortages. And the fourth one was uh, offshoring and outsourcing. You don't need to bring people into your own country if people are old or if you don't have the skills, you could kind of rely on Raul sitting in Cayman or Amlan sitting somewhere else in Timbuktu. So those were the four things. At that point in time, that was just policy prescription. Then looking at countries, I said, India has lots of problems. Brazil has lots of problems. Mexico has lots of problems. These countries are young. And as somebody who'd been doing emerging markets since 1980 on IMF World Bank projects, I went and lo looked up a term called demographics because I was discontent with my initial four or five months of research, despite the demographic manifesto. And I Googled, uh, those days there was no Google, there was Yahoo. Where does the word etymologically demographics come from? And there are two roots, demos, which is people, and graphos, which is characteristics. Nowhere in the definition of demographics is there number of people, young people, old people, etc. Uh, and then I came across a quote from somebody who's considered the biggest management guru of 20th century, not by me, but my classmates who were the deans of Harvard and were the personal advisors to Jack Welch, the head of Harvard strategy department. And the name of this person, I'll tell you in a minute, but this person challenged GM Chrysler and Ford in 1976 in a book called Pensions Revolution. So not only is this person a management guru, but also pensions guru saying that GM Chrysler Ford in a book in 1976 would go bankrupt for making pension promises that they can't keep. I cheated from this person in 1976, telling the European Commission with Draghi, Lagarde, all these people in the room that Greece is nothing but GM plus Chrysler multiplied by 50, and it would also face sustainability pressures, which they did five years later uh, after I predicted in 2006. And these unsustainable promises, all countries will need to renegotiate, and countries which are starting from scratch have a big, big advantage. So the person who said this was Peter Drucker. The etymology of the term demographics was demos people, graphos characteristics. Nowhere is age, nowhere is women, nowhere is number of people. So to me, it's about people characteristics. And in investments and in economics, the two best characteristics of people I know is from the time they're born till the date they die, they are consumers. A baby born in Great Ormond Street Hospital is a consumer, uh, born one hour ago. So is a woman aged 114 years, eight months in Okinawa, Japan. They're consuming different things. Eight billion is the number of consumers because everyone in the world is a consumer. Every, every individual is a consumer. Then we look at the second characteristic. Second characteristic of majority of us or nearly all of us is we are workers. However, workers are, after you've done university education, largely workers are between the age of 20 to 70. There are exceptions in places like Japan where people work beyond 70. There are exceptions who are teenage programming geniuses uh, at age 13 or 14. But by and large, we are essentially workers. And as workers, we make the GDP of countries. We make the profits of companies. And as consumers, we consume those profits. We also consume whatever the economy is. So my single big contribution to this whole literature, which the Fed, the ECB, the US Treasury, et cetera, use, is demographics is no longer short term and uh, long term. It is immediate, short term, medium term, as well as long term. Because today, what's being consumed in Korea is affecting its GDP today. What's being consumed in US is affecting its GDP today. If the demand is greater than the supply, 
as is the case in the country where real estate prices did not fall during the global financial crisis. And even today, they are going gangbusters to use the term of Boris Johnson as far as economic outlook goes. It's, some, it's a place which may even outdo Cayman Islands or uh, Bahamas or Barbados. The name of the country is Monaco. Okay. So prices are going up out there because just like during global financial crises, the real estate properties went up. People to show off started buying bigger yachts, bigger, smaller islands, uh, and luxury liners. Similarly, we are seeing that what is called demographics is actually to be looked at from the lens of consumers and workers. So that was my very, very short intro. And if you put that as a wrapper on Fed policy, the biggest um, lacuna part of Fed policies was trying to determine R star. That is the natural rate of interest. All of the Fed framework relies on that. That's considered the equilibrium rate of interest. And there were two people. One person runs the New York Fed. The other person passed away two weeks ago. Uh, they developed the classic models in the early 2000s of the natural rate of interest. Recently, thanks to Jay Powell in the Fed lesson series, in an attempt to make the Fed's working, to make the monetary policy more transparent, all these things that Jay Powell has done, for which he deserves definitely a lot of kudos because he's not a geek like the PhDs I follow coming out of universities who can't explain why they are doing things. So the Fed Listen series challenged our star. And what they found out is they had ignored two important things in their models. Number one, globalization. Number two, demographics. So now Stan Fisher, who just today on LinkedIn, you will see, has won a very important award from the Global Center of Finance at MIT. He was one of the few people while he was at the IMF and at the Fed, basically said that demographics is affecting the natural rate of interest, the short-term interest rate also, because demand for short-term interest rates are relative to supply is happening by workers and by consumers. So demographics affects profit, and loss of every company, every country, every household, according to me, because they affect the demand and supply of goods and services. And my second important point is demographics is not long-term. It's immediate, short-term, medium-term, long-term. So to summarize, demographics equals consumers and workers. Demographics is definitely not long-term. That's a myopic approach. It is immediate, short-term, medium-term, long-term. If today people were to demand more Ferraris and Lamborghinis in the Cayman or in, let's say, Monaco, prices of those would go up. So you can't say that demographics is only long term because consumer preferences evolve and they also change. So that's the second uh, contribution. And the third contribution is take any company. Let's take an interesting company today. Take Tesla, take Wirecard or take SoftBank. Demand or even Procter & Gamble. Consumers are revenues. Workers are costs. So for any company, its consumer base affects its revenues. Its workers, its raw material affects its cost. Revenues minus cost affect income statement and p &L. So those are my fundamental core beliefs of demographics around which we can talk about how demographics affects asset prices, different countries, etc. Yeah, I just want to give the caveat, as you mentioned before, is you know, you're, you're, um, the, the views that you're talking about here are your own. And Because what, what, what do you do now, just before we dig in, just explain what, what you're doing now. Oh, so I joined State Street Global Advisors in 2017 from Credit Suisse as Chief Retirement Strategist. Because at Credit Suisse, not only did I develop demographics, but I used demographics to affect asset liability management of pension funds and insurance companies, advise governments on pension reforms, but also companies such as IBM, DA, BP, Nestle, Monsanto on how to manage their corporate balance sheets. This allowed me to bring together both my macro knowledge and my finance knowledge of what discount rates to use to discount liabilities. How do you hedge? Should you hold private equity? How do you do strategic ALM? So I joined as chief retirement strategist in 2017, April. And last year, after two years, 
they asked me to head a very small team called Global Macro, where our small team does politics and policy, does demographics and retirement, but we also do economics. So that's my day job. Uh, I'm veering away from just doing retirement and demographics. And uh, my two decades of doing demographics was recently, thankfully, acknowledged by the Institute and Faculty of Actuaries by nominating and electing me an honorary fellow. And that voting went out across 31 countries. So it's not just pensions at a level telling how should a pension system be designed, but also how should individual corporate pensions look at things. Why is um, Australian pension system different than Netherlands? What lessons can we learn from immigration in Australia and Canada and those kind of things? I just want to dig in a little bit. I mean, it always staggers me that most economists don't use demographics in the framework. You know, they, they, they have this linear world, but d- demographics are relatively predictable, particularly over longer term time horizons. When you talk about demographics in the shorter term, how do you apply models to that? And how does it help you? Because that's not, not something I hear a lot. That's true. Because if demographics were predictable, all you need to do is count the number of people who were born on a given date and extend it based on life expectancy to probably 80 years ahead for US, 88 years ahead for Japan, and so on and so forth. And you may have few people who die by accidents, etc. But that is falsifiable because in emerging markets, also because you have wars, you have epidemics, you have other kinds of natural disasters, um, you have In Japan, a median age of 48. And in Malawi and Niger, you have a median age of 15. So these are two countries within the same world. So if you just looked at life expectancy, you may get a very different nuance than trying to think that in Niger and Malawi also, people are getting connected with the internet, with Google, trying to get classes, trying to get paid. And in the poorest of countries, people now know what exists in other countries. They can take courses online. They can order things on Amazon. They can try and see where uh, better weathers are, where food is expensive, where food is cheap, etc. So the information divide, which used to be dictated a lot by money and by location, that has gone down. Um, So to give you an example, how would you apply? You would apply by looking at what are the prospects for GDP per capita growth. So I tell my CEOs and clients, if GDP per capita growth goes down as it is going down in 70 odd countries, that means the amount by which my wallet is growing every year goes down. What do I do out of my GDP per capita? That's a proxy for disposable income after I've paid taxes. Out of my disposable income, there are only two things I can do. I can either consume a lot or I can cut my consumption and increase my savings. So to make it real, during this COVID crisis, the U.S. government paid lots of people $600 a week, as a result of which we saw a skyrocketing of the savings rate. People were very perplexed. Why did savings go up? Why didn't they spend a lot of money, including a lot of CEOs and CIOs? And it was very easy for me to explain it to them. U.S. has one of the most unequal health systems in the world. Also, the bottom quarter quartile of the U.S. health um, of U.S. population doesn't have access to good public health care, insurance, hospitals, nor do they have good savings in case they were to have COVID. So, the precautionary savings motive is what helped them save a lot. So they didn't take the entire 2400 and just consume it. They saw people dying in other states. They were a bit scared. They said, let's save it for a rainy day. But this is not something which just happened in the US. It happened in other countries also, in Japan, in Germany, in Italy, etc. So all these countries, governments gave money saying, let's help people support themselves. And people realized, yes, this COVID thing is not under control. Virus is not under control let's say, for a rainy day. That's one example. The second example is, how do millennials consume? Do they consume like baby boomers did? No. They are in a sharing economy. 
They believe in a renting economy. They believe in traveling the world. They believe in saving the planet. They believe in climate change. So unlike baby boomers, who by the age of 30, 84% of them were married, and within next five, six years, nearly 90% of them went and bought their house, most millennials have not. And millennials are very distinctly different than the baby boomers in their consumption, in their caring about planet, in sharing. And if that be the case, their preferences govern what kind of goods they are consuming. Are they buying um, cars? Are they buying houses? Are they kind of renting? Are they wanting the mobility? All these are reflections of consumer preferences. So in some way, my initial notion of demographics is quite close to behavioral finance because it's about consumer behavior, consumer psychology, and it's also about worker behavior and worker psychology. The same $100 given in New York City is different than $100 given in Baton Rouge to one of the poorest families in Louisiana or in Alabama or in, uh, or in Missouri. And those are things that macroeconomists need to look at. And I learned this from one of the gurus uh, of macroeconomics. I come from a fairly illustrious group of trained people who are the Chicago School. And Bob Lucas won his Nobel Prize for saying that macro at an aggregate level doesn't hold. We need to understand the micro foundations of macroeconomics. Why do people in nuclear families consume differently than people in joint families? Why do poor black families consume differently than poor white families? Why do Hispanics who've come out on a boat consume differently than the people who came from the Nordics to Minnesota and settled out there? And those are things which are important to try and understand. And microeconometrics is a new field where people try to understand why incentives given across the whole population doesn't affect the people in the 10th decile the same way as in the first decile. So as you say, I mean, it's an interesting blend between behavioral economics and demographics to create a new world of understanding. I just want to go back a little bit about the, the savings rate and the, the propensity to increase savings versus expenditure. When you break it down by demographic cohorts, what was the driver? Was it the baby boomers who were worried about their health? And 76 million in the US decided, okay, we need some more savings. And, you know, the millennials started trading the stock market. How did you look at that? Very, very good question. And I don't know whether you remember me uh, for saying this earlier, but the wealthiest generation, again, demographics teaches us several lessons. And one of the lessons that I learned digging through data is that the richest age group in the world across the G10 whether it's Switzerland or Japan or Germany or UK or US, is the 65 to 74 year old age group. And they are the richest because they had a quadruple bonus. No other generation has had that. Generations being born today or the millennial generation are the first generation who are likely to be worse off than their parent generation. Baby boomers were the first generation who turned out to be multiply well off relative to their parent generation. And that was thanks to 1980 to 2000 being characterized as a period of very high GDP growth, very high real estate prices, very high equity growth, and very high bond growth. So over those two decades, if you were a 35-year-old or 30-year-old in 1980, you were just off to the races, a la uh, Malcolm Gladwell's book, Outliers, you were born in the right place, right time. Kind of very similarly to the fact that Steve Jobs, uh, Vinod Khosla, and uh, Bill Gates were all born within three weeks of each other. Hmm. So that's an interesting anecdote. And they hit the, their university days at a time when the world was saying, go and invent new technology. NSF was giving grants to play around with new computers, to play around with integrated circuits and develop new prototypes for those models. So yes, the baby boom generation is the richest. And today, if you look at them, they are getting paid on top of it much better 
promises, legacy promises, which have been made in the generations before them. So I chastise those uh, promises and I say those promises are unsustainable unless you want to steal from the younger millennials and Gen Y and Gen Zs and give it to the baby boomers because that in effect is what is happening. The baby boomers are rich. They are the people who are subsidizing their kids to, into getting their first mortgages because based on their first salaries, you aren't. Today's job market is a very tough job market. If you go to the best student from Oxford in 2000, they used to have 12, 13 job offers in the first week of the companies coming. Now they are lucky if they get one or two, same in Harvard, same in MIT. So it's a tough job market out there. So the savings behavior of millennials is, if anything, they're putting things on their credit cards, they are dissaving. And the people who've saved up are in a really cushy position. They are the people who are buying second houses. So here's a famous chart of mine. In, during the global financial crisis, I showed a breakdown of real estate behavior. And I presented it uh, at a BlackRock CIO meeting in 2009, 2010, showing that the 65 to 74 year olds were the dominant people buying new houses. Until 2009, 2010, the dominant age group was 35 to 44. So people had kids in their late 20s, early 30s, and then started buying houses. That's what used to happen. But in 2010, 2012, who was buying houses? Baby boomers, they were buying their retirement houses in, so the Germans were buying it in South Africa. The Americans were buying it in Mexico, buying it in Peru, buying it in places that they could kind of afford in the Caribbean, in Barbados, Bahamas, et cetera. So that was a trend. Even today, the baby, uh, the, there are two features to be noted. When at age of 30, roughly about 30% of the millennials are married relative to baby boomers. So if you're not married, you have the flexibility of not thinking about buying and pinning yourself down to one location, trying to buy a house. So they are much more footloose, fancy free. They care much more about the environment. They care about experiences. They don't think about lifelong employment. Whereas the baby boomers join IBM, join, uh, let's say, Procter & Gamble, join Boeing, and join CNN and spend your whole career there. Join ABC. Now, no one joins broadcasting and stays uh, in the way we have seen earlier comedians like, uh, um, like Letterman, Leno, etc. spend their whole careers in one TV station. Now you find people going and doing different gigs. So the gig economy is largely also a reflection of behavior of these people. Now, I must tell you about a book which highlights this, and then I'll tell you about macro. This is a book which is absolutely essential for anyone who wants to understand the micro trends behind macro phenomena. And it's written by Bill Clinton's political guru. Uh, without him, Bill Clinton won't have reached White House. He was also the political guru for Hillary Clinton in the first round, but then gave up. And his name is Mark Penn. He's the guy who coined the term, name Soccer Mom, Hockey Mom that you talk about. So he's the king of consumer service. And so his first book was Microtrends. That coincided with when I was learning demographics, 2000 to 2004. Then last year at Milken in 2019, he's published a rejoinder. So he talks about the Amazon women. He talks about older dads. He talks about 90 winkers. And his recent book is called Microtrend Squared. So it's a clever book. It's a little bit like uh, Malcolm Gladwell, but it's more along societal themes of pharmaceutical, drug prescriptions, about people's going to theater, et cetera, et cetera. So Malcolm Gladwell takes one of those themes and writes one book. Mark Penn takes a lot of those and puts it. Now, savings are very important. You may remember Bernanke blaming his inability 
to explain capital flows on savings trends and calling it a savings glut hypothesis. He said interest rates are low because people in Asia, Latin America, emerging markets are saving a lot. They want safe returns. Where do they invest? They invest in US. So there's a lot of demand for those returns. Supply is low and you find those returns high. And uh, he explained part of it on that. Now, there's somebody who academically and theoretically is a bigger visionary than him. And that person said the following at the FOMC um, is older than Bernanke and has written very influential papers, maybe legacy wise could be remembered more than Bernanke, uh, is a person called William Poole. He used to be the head of the St. Louis Fed and head of FOMC. In 1994 and 97, he wrote two very influential papers. That the biggest thing we do not understand about current account and capital flows, he said, is demographics in two very important ways. And then there was a guy called Higgins in New York Fed, and the person speaking with you, we looked at 115 odd countries and we showed that the savings investment gap, if there were only two parts of the world, emerging markets and developed markets, is the single biggest reason for capital flows. Now, why do people in poorer countries and in emerging markets save more? Because they don't have the safety net. They do not have uh, the healthcare system, just like the poorest people in Louisiana, Alabama, Tennessee, et cetera. So the poorest black states have very poor healthcare, high obesity, low access to public health. So if you were to go and give them the same windfall that people do get in major cities, they won't tend to save more. And that's my conclusion. So savings investment gaps leads to capital flows. And we've written quantitative papers on it. Matt Higgins from New York Fed and myself. One of the things that I've looked at is this opportunity set that the boomers had that you talked about. They had record low PEs, record high interest rates when they started their savings, you know, at the age of 30. I mean, it was a complete windfall for them, right place, right time. You've got the millennial generation with record high um, equity valuations, record low yields, record low credit, um, and extraordinarily unaffordable property. How do they deal with this? I mean, obviously, they're opting out. They're just not doing some of it. But, but how do they deal with this opportunity set? At a conference, which is one of the biggest trading conferences in Canada, in 2016, in Mont-Tremblant, uh, it's called, it's the biggest buy and sell side trading conference. So I gave the same example um, at that conference saying older people are buying more real estate. And the organizer of the conference was an ex-trader, age 71. And she said, yes, I've just extended my backyard, which extends for nearly an acre to create a extension for my, so that I can see more of my daughter and my son-in-law and my granddaughter uh, out there. Otherwise, I won't get to see them. And so people said, are you spending for that? She said, yeah, my savings went in that. And they won't have been able to afford to come and live in Toronto. But now they live in a plush neighborhood. Otherwise, I would have had to travel. So a lot of the second houses that people were buying in their late 50s, 60s, and 70s, those who could afford it, are now buying it for their children or helping them get up the ladder or doing an equity release in London to help them afford other things. But you raise a very important question. This is again from another speech. So I think today's world is a world which finance theory can't deal with, is a world which central bankers are inept to deal with, and none of the models work very well in this world. So let me take you to how we teach interest rate derivatives, yield curves, and things like that. So to look at a yield curve, how do you develop the yield curve? You start with the treasury bill, risk-free asset. You add a maturity premium, so that explains 10-year, 20, 30-year treasuries. Then you add a credit default, so that explains corporates. Then you add an emerging markets yield component. So typically, you're going from a safe asset 
to building lots of risk premium, whether it's a default risk premium, it's a maturity risk premium, it's an inflation risk premium, etc. So the yield curve sloped upwards. Okay, so there are two things which are anathema to basic principles of economics of finance. Number one, and I explained it, Google it and you'll get it. There was a keynote speech I gave in Brussels at the Euronext conference saying abnormal world, low yield, low growth, low inflation. When do we get out of it and what does it take? And uh, so the first anathema is I borrow some money from you. Let's say $10,000 or 10,000 pounds. And I give you about 2,000 pounds or dollars in notes, which will require you to go to Florida to exchange because they're kind of damaged notes. No one is going to kind of take it in the corner shop. So first, I return to you exactly 10,000 and I give you damaged. In other words, it's going to cost you to lend money to me. That's the equivalent of negative interest rates. So if I save money and I'm going to get on the dollar, 94, 95, 97, 98. What's the incentive for me to save? Why don't I consume it? That's what many are doing, consuming and over-consuming. So the first thing which contradicts um, basics of lending and borrowing is interest rates should be upward sloping and second interest rates should be positive because in economics and finance, there are four factors of production in any business. Land, price of land is rent. Labor, price of labor is wages. Capital, price of capital is interest rate. Entrepreneurship, price of entrepreneurship is profits. This is standard Adam Smith, Ricardo standard finance. Now the thing which is mispriced over the last 10 years, and I will blame central bankers largely for it, who think that they are omnipotent, super potent, or think that they are gods, is that they've made the world flush of money and have uh, distorted the fact that interest rates should be linked to the marginal productivity of capital. There has to be, if, I, if you lend me some money, I should be giving you back that money with some interest because that is why you want to lend money to me. Second, yield curves being inverted basically means that I borrow from you for one year and you charge me an interest rate of 2%. Somebody borrows from you for 30 years, much greater uncertainty, and you give them 0.1%. Where does that make sense? Is the uncertainty greater over 30 years? or is it greater over two years? So these are the fundamentals of economics or the basics of risk-taking which are violated in the modern day world. And if they are violated, then standard models of CAPM or Markowitz, all those things, particularly in a dynamic sense, do not hold water. So we need to create inflation. We need nominal interest rates to be positive, even if they are barely above zero but we need them to be upward sloping because large, longer periods means more uncertainty. Everyone knows that. Doesn't demographics weigh on that? Doesn't it force? Not totally. It weighs on the fact that central banks thought about being omnipotent and sorting out all the problems since the global financial crisis by throwing money and calling it unconventional monetary policy. The jury is out and there are many people in the Fed, et cetera, saying that quantitative easing may have served a purpose, but every successive bout of it has been unsuccessful or has had limited bite. Partly because in the past, whenever we were in crises or in times which required action, fiscal policy came to the four first. And there's one advantage of fiscal policy. It is not as non-transparent as monetary policy. Monetary policy, you create money, you give a loan, where does the person spend? You don't know. 
fiscal policy, and we used to teach it in the 70s and 80s, it used to be popular because you create a bridge, you create schools, you create infrastructure, you employ people, there's expenditure, you create missiles for defense, there's expenditure. Today, the monetary transmission mechanism is broken. And part of it is because monetary policy doesn't have bite and it is largely ineffective in a world growing old because young people don't have the effectiveness and old people call the shots. And the models that people in the Fed are using are the models of the 70s and 80s. Yes, demographics comes into play to the extent that the old people have a lot of money. They can decide what to do with their money, but it also explains why the Japanese, the Germans, the Swiss, and the Italians at age 65 are investing a lot more in risky assets rather than in the safe asset. Because many of them know that in today's world, even at age 65, they may live till 85 or 90. And here's the big question I want you to note down. And this shows you how little we understand about the world. So this is the question that I've been asking for the last 20 years. So Raul says, Amla age 65. I guarantee you that you are very close to God. And using God's longevity model, you tell me, Amlan, you're going to die when you're 85. Let's take that as given. I retire at 65 today. I die at 85. My simple question to the house, indeed, to more than 30 Nobel laureates, still unanswered is, how much money do I need for 20 years of post-retirement? No uncertainty regarding how long I live. 20 years. No one's managed to answer it. No, and look, I mean, Amlan, I saw, and I've used this on Real Vision before, my father go through exactly this. And the problem is, is you don't know as individuals. If a bunch of Nobel laureates can't answer it, individuals can't. So what I've noticed is they tend, they, they tend, to, collapse consum they tend to collapse consumption because of it, because they have the fear of running out of money. Yeah, and, and this is what is happening. And that's why I'm a Bayesian and I believe in the following. So let me tell you why no one can give me the answer to it. And I've asked this to people who are CEOs, CIOs of BlackRock. I've asked this to Goldman CEO, et cetera. Number one, healthcare. No one can tell me over 20 years what I need for healthcare. If nothing else, COVID is proving it. Epidemics, MS, ME, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, big unknown. Number two, where will interest rates be? No one can even tell you next two years where interest rates are going to be. Forget about 20 years. Where will asset returns be? No one 10 years ago could tell you about Tesla and Zoom and all having this kind of a run. So we don't know equity returns either. Number four, where will inflation be? If you went and told Stan Fisher, who's in his 70s, in 1970, that, oh, have you factored in negative inflation or deflation? They would laugh at you. Yeah, we've got like single digit inflation, double digit in some places. And we can't sort it out. So in a deflationary model, all macro models become unstable. You're in the long-term capital world. You need positive inflation for models to converge. With deflation, you don't have macro models and asset pricing models which converge. With negative interest rates, you have the same problem. So most of conventional, traditional financial theory is based on positive interest rates and positive inflation. Long-term capital went bust because it did not allow for that exception of negative and negative. Okay, And we should have learned from it, but still we haven't. So it's important to understand that Japan took two decades to get used to negative inflation rates. And here I will talk about a book written by two Nobel laureates, which highlights why macro models failed. They don't put demographics, but they put consumers, institutions, psychology, regulation, and behavior as things that economists didn't model. What did economists model? Economists model Raul as supercomputer one, Amlan as supercomputer two. So in MIT, still the standard question is, if the Fed were to increase interest rates, what would an average American do? Who is the average American? There is no average American in today's world. There's no prototype. 
we are microcosm of 300 different types of Americans. You model, put them together, then you'll get an idea of average American. And Sam Huntington, who is one of the biggest gurus of international relations and today would have, is famous, probably would have been even more famous because in his book, Clash of Civilizations, he did predict China versus US, Russia versus Crimea, the Muslim youth bulge. He predicted 9-11. He predicted what's happening in uh, Saudi Arabia, etc. So sometimes we really need to think about how we understand society. So the book Animal Spirits, written by George Akerlof and uh, George Akerlof, uh, Janet Yellen's husband and Nobel laureate, and Robert Schiller, talks about why 50 years of macro went wrong. And chapter one is greed. Chapter two is money illusion. Chapter three is psychology. Chapter four is institutions and so on and so forth. Because the moment you use math and physics computer models, and I've taught it by assuming that we behave like supercomputers, then we've lost it. That means we are looking at one type of an individual, one type of a family. It's easy to solve the model, but that's not reality. So it's important to understand that demographics is about consumer behavior, worker behavior, and this behavior changes based on our experiences. That's why micro trends is important. Those trends are emerging because somebody in the Hamptons is going through a very different experience cycle than somebody in the richest parts of South Africa or somebody in Cayman Islands or Bahamas or Barbados. We need to understand that age isn't the most determinant. And so I gave you five examples. The, I didn't give you the fifth example. Where you, so this is an example I gave the state of Illinois and state of New Jersey. If I retire with $300,000 in Chicago, that money would last me 40% less than what it would last me if I were to retire in DeKalb, Illinois, just 200 miles away from Chicago. Because the cost of living is low. So you don't know where I'm going to retire. So not knowing where I'm going to retire, inflation, asset prices, etc. So what's the best that you can do? And the best you can do, and this is what my learning from Japanese retirees, etc., is break the period of 25 or 30 years into smaller periods. You can look ahead five years. You can, then you come to year five, look ahead 10 years. If you start planning for 30 years, you're likely to go wrong because smaller trends can really throw you off your so it's important to understand healthy living is far more important. There are people who live as centenarians and who are very active in Okinawa, Japan, in Linda Lomas, California, and in Sardinia and Italy because they have a connectivity. And aging there stands for A is activity, G is genetics, E is exercise, I is interest, N is nutrition, and G is give up smoking. That explains how these people live longer. So the focus should not be on money. Focus should be on healthy living. And healthy living can allow you to enjoy a lot more of your wealth. I went for one of my business reunions. There's a classmate of mine. And we just, just like when we were undergrads, we shared a two-bedroom flat at the reunion. This is a person who's had major health problems but is worth 129 million, but doesn't have the health to enjoy that money as well. So one needs to think about those issues more carefully. Oh, I want to ask you a question, something that you know intimately. The key thing about the developed markets for me is, okay, we understand the demographics. We've seen how you can break it down to behavioral understanding to get a better understanding of trends and why things happen and what they occur which most people aren't doing in demographics, which is some, one of the areas you've pioneered. But I want to get an understanding of what the hell are we going to do about the pension system? Ah, perfect question. So pension system, and I've given this speech at PBGC, but people earlier than me have talked about it. So I just referred to Peter Drucker. Do not make long-term promises you can't keep. Somebody at some point in time in a company or in social security fund made those promises when most people were dying within 65. Today, when most of the people are living 85, 90, et cetera, you should renegotiate those promises for people of your and my generation and no longer have guaranteed promises. 
So I'll give you an example. I will not name the country, but this is what that country is doing. It says that you will get alpha Raul or Amlan if the GDP of our country does better than the G7 GDP by 1%. Otherwise, you'll get beta or gamma, okay, which are three states. You will get delta 1 if the stock market of our country does better than S&P 500 by 1% or more. You will get delta 2 if it's between 0 to 1% and delta 3. So all promises need to be conditional based on GDP growth in your country, asset returns in your country, and life expectancy increase of your cohort relative to the younger cohort. So you cannot have unconditional promises. How do you go back with these unconditional promises now to all of these baby boomers? People are doing it because same way that American Airlines and Delta did it, restructure and say we are bankrupt, we can't pay your pension promises. And that's what they've done. So had United Auto Workers agreed and had management explained these things to them earlier, then we wouldn't have seen the GM Chrysler Ford bankruptcies because then we would have seen a sharing with stakeholders called workers and companies. Workers should realize if the companies aren't making profits, you shouldn't get paid. And this is something which baffled me also in investment banks and in banking. If a bank makes a loss, why do people get paid bonuses? Fundamentals of capitalism basically mean that everyone, if you're a stakeholder, you share in the stakes. The only people I can see getting paid and getting paid a bonus when companies make billions of losses, whether it's GFC or it's some real estate bubble, etc., is the people who make less than $50,000 or less than $60,000. They deserve, okay, give them, and it's fair. But otherwise, there are no incentives. And in economics, we have carrots and sticks. You give carrots, and you also need to give sticks. Otherwise, um, one thing in financial services and in banking that people notice is People just drum the beat of the trade that is successful. They forget all the trades where they've lost money. So I still remember somebody who got indicted for $2 billion plus loss. I remember how he used to go around like a macho person saying, oh, I've made single-handedly made $20 million, uh, or $30 million profit um, just working two, three months in a year. So when he loses, he loses like 2.6 billion in his team. And when he makes money, uh, it may be 30 million net in just two months. Then they never stop speaking about it. There's um, one of the interesting things. I was speaking to Neil Howe, who wrote the book Before Turning. One of the things he talked about that I think is interesting, it's right up your street because it's kind of micro demographical thing, is the rise of multi-generational households, which is kind of what you're alluding to with the second homes is you're seeing millennial, you know, these baby boomers with big houses, the millennials saying we can't afford it. They move in together. It basically saves on looking after the kids because you've got grandparents. It's the old Indian model or the Mediterranean model that, you know, you know, and I know from, you know, I, my father's Indian is, you know, that multi-generational household means that you need less pension savings. And you have that thing. It seems like there is a rise of that. No. So let me tell you, 2002, Atlanta Fed, I gave this example of, uh, of five generation households. So Neil Howe is too late. You can Google and see that I've said this in more than 100 conferences before, along with another person, Jim O'Neill, who was Goldman Sachs chief economist at the BlackRock, BlackRock Investor Day. So here's my classic example since 2002. There's, I mean, I could talk on for hours. A 91-year-old retiree with a 67-year-old son, a 46-year-old daughter, 23-year-old granddaughter, and a toddler of six months. That's the new reality. It's happening in US, Germany, Switzerland, Italy. Two generations of retirees. And what I prove wrong by going to the PBGC and the Institute of Actuaries is challenging them on three-generation models. Today's reality is four and five generations. So when I went to present in 2001, my first visit to Mexico, and you'll see that in their social security system, I'm attributed for that. 
I said that the American pension system is in trouble. And the head of Mexican pension uh, social security said, we don't have that problem because we live in multi-generation households. So we know that we will always support uh, the older people. I said, but now it's no longer supporting one generation. Let's say I'm 46, I have to support two generations of retirees and I have to support two generations below me. How much do I need to save? And this is very similar to asking and answering the question, the women generation are the biggest generation of people in their 50s and 60s who are looking after the older generation. 80% of people in the 80s and 90s, if they're relying on their kids, most of them are females, okay? Um, I'm not gender biased, but that's what surveys show time and again. And those females say, we are getting squeezed like an Oreo cookie. We are looking after our parents. We are also looking after our kids and sometimes their grandchildren. So it's that kind of a thing. The dynamic is very important. And just today, uh, if you go into BBC, just Google BBC, and today it talks about the growth of joint families in India and a demographer and a sociologist are saying that despite modernization, nuclearization, the people who are living in nuclear families are people in the low income group. The middle class family is still in Mumbai and Delhi, still largely trying to adhere to living in joint families because only then they can take care of their older parents and their older parents have to stay with them. So this is just today's, I, I accidentally stumbled on, onto it. It's on the BBC website. Today. Because, you know, how I look at it is, is a parent has a house and let's say their house, because they had the luck of being born when they did and the asset price rises, they have a house that's now worth $700,000. Their kids can't afford to buy a house for $700,000. It's too big a house because the kids have left home. So they move in together. The parents have some savings because they're baby boomers and they've, they've got either a pension plan or some savings. The kids don't yet have savings because they're still broke from university. But when you put them together in that three-generational household, it works. Absolutely. Now, I understand what you're saying. A four-generational household, it depends how much the savings of the, most, of the eldest has been depleted. Because um, if not, you're then supporting people. But also another thing is people who are typically in their 80s are in reasonably good health. It's mainly in their 60s and 70s, those who pass away or who have morbidity, they pass away. And lots of times, uh, this is research from the centenarians, the people who are happiest and live together are people who are living with their grandchildren and great-grandchildren. So there's an enormous psychological benefit to the Okinawans and the Sardinians who are in their 90s and going up the mountains with their great-grandchildren and being engaged as part of village life and of family life. So that's another reason why the Mexicans and the people in uh, uh, countries such as South Africa believe that living jointly will help come out of this pension or social security. But it requires people to live together and uh, then to pool together their resources. There's another thing which goes against it is sometimes it's not easy for multiple generations of the current generation to live together. So no matter how good the millennials are, Gen X, Gen Ys are, they really would love to move out and have their independence. Otherwise, the sense of achievement is also not there. So yes, economically, they would be forced in. So what they would like to do is have a house down the street, which, they, which is rented, and they come and look up their parents and help them rather than moving in. And even in Italy, and in parts of US, in India, a lot of my friends are fairly affluent. What do they do? They buy an apartment in the next building or in the same building for their mother-in-law and one for their mother, just making sure that the two are slightly further apart. <laughs> hey, listen, I want to ask you another question that you talked about before. You, you said you presented on you know, low interest rates, high debt, low inflation, blah, blah, blah. Can we get out of it? What was your conclusion? Yes, absolutely. So the conclusion to that is very simple. And uh, again, you can get it in just those things, is create more fiscal policy, 
go back to normalcy, that negative interest rates will not be to create, what does it require you to create inflation? Inflation is excess demand for goods and services relative to supply. Now, in a regular world, inflation should be there because your bottom interest rate, which is demand and supply, your treasury interest rate is positive and you add risk premium. The only way you can go negative is if you're not pricing those things in policy. So fiscal policy, and this is also a paper by Stan Fisher, where he says that short-term interest rates are affected by demographics because the savings behavior of the older people means that they are saving a lot more relative to what they should be spending and buying for their thing. So also there is, um, I'm trying to remember, Patrick Imam, who simultaneous to me, wrote a paper for IMF calling the ineffectiveness of monetary policy in a graying world. Okay, so had we kept interest rates high, and this is what, again, why I believe in John Taylor, and John Taylor criticized uh, Bernanke, Fisher, et cetera, for keeping interest rates so low just before, and Greenspan for keeping interest rates so low just before the crisis. He said, you took away the wiggle room of people to reduce interest rates prior to a crisis. So had you applied Taylor's formula, interest rates would have been 4% before the GFC. So if it's 4% and you bring it down, you would still be at 2%. A lot of the malaise of the current world is a vicious cycle of not being able to. So to me, the biggest achievement of macro monetary policy is something that you'll come to in a bit, is the war over inflation has been won in India, Venezuela, Israel, Turkey, South Africa, and all these emerging markets where inflation rates are single digits. Okay, so that started happening in 1990 through inflation targeting. But the flip side is we've tightened too much. And in the developed world, we've been unable to create inflation. So the inability to even create inflation worth 2% is the biggest um, deficiency in my mind of central banking. And central bankers, in the absence of fiscal policy, are trying to change thing at the fringes, but every successive new thing that they do is not adding much to the policy. So the Fed itself, one of my co-authors at the Fed, has looked at unconventional monetary policy across four countries, Japan, uh, UK, US, and also I think he looked at Sweden or Denmark, and he said that it's not been that great a success if you measure it against what the central bankers said when they were doing. It's as if you're asking people uh, on a 100 mile per hour street to drive at 200. Yes, and eke it down to 210. So what are people doing? They are cheating. They're putting a meter where 100 seems like 120, but actually is not. And that's what's happening with monetary policy. We have assumed that they are gods. And, and as a teacher of monetary policy, I will claim that this is a time where fiscal policy is much needed. And the reason fiscal policy isn't happening is because most places in the world where fiscal policy should happen, we are seeing coalition, weak, fragile coalitions. So as General Powell said, we do not have the budgetary authority to ensure that the White House and Pentagon and most departments in Washington run beyond December. And earlier, he said, there used to be natural goodwill between the parties that we will be nonpartisan for the greater good of America. We will agree to compromise. Now, going at each other's throats means budgets not getting passed and therefore fiscal policy being nearly absent. So I, this morning at an internal seminar, I was talking about Abe's successor. And to me, I met Abe before he got reelected and one conference in Hong Kong over lunch, where I'd given uh, a speech. And uh, I think, no, I gave the evening speech, he gave the lunch speech, and we were at the same lunch table. And he gave me his vision that Japan took two decades to get used to negative, rate, uh, negative prices. 
We are not used to negative prices. So let me tell you, you go to Giant, so you come here to Waitrose, and I cut the price of everything in the shop between minus 11% and minus 23%. And your spending bill, I cut by minus 15%. And I tell you, go and shop. We are not used to thinking, bread has gone down minus 11, that has gone down minus, how to allocate money? We are only used to thinking in positive. So it took Japan two decades to uh, align themselves with the psychology of negative prices. This is what Akerlof and Schiller call money illusion. So if we need more fiscal policy, we need positive inflation, we need positive interest rates, and most of all, we need to understand that the marginal product of capital, which in equilibrium is equal to an interest rate, should never be negative, should at best be zero. Negative means then you spend less on capital. Anything which is giving you negative, you just, it's like I'm drinking poison. So every additional glass of whiskey beyond my five glasses of whiskey is poison for my whatever liver or kidneys. So I kind of have less of that and taper it off at five kind of glasses of whiskey or a bottle, whatever. <laughs> or a bottle, I like that. Okay, so look. Um... We've spent a lot of time talking about a lot of the, the West and the issues that it faces and some of the opportunities. What makes you optimistic in the world? Where is using your framework, what gets you excited? I think trying to understand the changing world without, while understanding that a lot of the theories I learned, I taught are wrong and inept for today's world means I need to understand the mindset of consumers, just to give you an example, why is private equity growing? Why can't pension funds basically make due with their liabilities just using equities and bonds? Bonds are yielding negative. Bonds, which were very good in the 60s, 70s, 80s, were good because they were high in terms of single digits or they were close to double digits. Today, bonds are giving you negative. That's like poison. So fixed income should be emerging markets bonds, should be corporate bonds, should be high yield. That's the new fixed income. And then alternatives, you have real estate, infrastructure, commodities, hedge funds, etc. So we need to look at asset allocation. These challenges will come. But I do think we need to think at the world afresh and create a more harmonious world where I think, isn't it great that people are living into the 80s and 90s? Why don't they give something back more to society? And part of it is we need more the people of the Bill Gross category who had a 40-year good run earlier, but now to look at new asset classes because the asset classes he worked on worked well when you're coming down from 7 8 Nine to 1%. And this is what a lot of people have been interested in cryptocurrencies and other things because they offer potentially uncorrelated asset classes that have higher expected returns, obviously with higher risk as well, but that's okay. You get compensated for the risk. Yeah. Also, a changing world is a changing world in terms of digital currencies. So I speak every year in the Singapore FinTech Festival, paid for by the central government of Singapore. It's fascinating. 60,000 people last year from 120 countries digital currencies, artificial learning, artificial intelligence, machine learning, big data, how to use that for health, how to use that for payments. Why is Rwanda and uh, um, Kenya ahead of US in terms of digital payments? Why is Rwanda ahead of US in terms of gender? Those are kind of questions that, how come um, I gave a speech at the Singapore FinTech Festival with the guy who invented Skype? And he's looking at big picture issues. You should try and get him. He's moving away from fintech and he's trying to look at problems for the next century. Health is at the core of that. Robotization is at another thing. And I challenged Eric Brynolfsson in front of Jerome Powell saying, oh, do you want robots to control human beings or human beings to control robots? And also the rise of emerging markets is fascinating because they were growing they've kind of started tapering off a little bit and people are talking about globalization going in reverse. That's wrong. That's because they take a narrow version of globalization, which is based on trade and movement of people. Countries, when they are doing well, they embrace people to come. 
Sweden, Norway, Netherlands, US, UK. When GDP per capita is growing, come and share beer in my garden, have pizza, enjoy a barbecue. But when I'm not doing well, my gates are locked to you. And that's what rich countries are doing in this crisis. And therefore, poorer countries are realizing that they have to sort out some of their problems themselves. So the notion of a demographic dividend, which was captured by South East Asian and South Asian countries called the Asian Tigers in the 80s and 90s, was because men and women decided they're going to have fewer children, educate them better, better educated people entered the workforce, became more productive. So you have fewer people contributing more to GDP. GDP per capita went up, and that's the demographic dividend. Today, it could happen with technology, or it could happen by generations banding together, countries coming together, thinking about a better environmental world, thinking about a world where the ultra-consumerism we saw uh, as somebody um, who is in Germany, a big fund manager said, my father was um, the deputy CEO of Siemens. He had three suits. Everyone who works in my team of 15, all those 20, 30 year olds are driving Maybachs and have 20 suits. Do we need it? And those are issues we need to kind of address in a world where there are more important things like health, inequality. What keeps me alive is the fact that I agonize about our industry not doing well. We get excited once in a while when we see George Floyd, but inequality is festering in our industry where we don't give women equal opportunities. We rarely bring in black minorities. You've been in Canary Wharf. Where do you see them? You don't see much of them. And then all of a sudden, when there's this thing we want to preach to others, yeah, employ more women, etc. It has to come naturally. We need to think about a more... I'm a capitalist at heart, but I do believe that if I'm paying my taxes, they should go for the lowest 10-15%. And we need to have a better distribution. Give the uber rich great incentives to people like uh, Elon Musk and Peter Thiel and on- other entrepreneurs. Because what they are creating will help the rest of the world. But out of their personal income, you have to tax them. Then you need to make sure they can do better for society in generation by way of multipliers. You allow them to invest. You need to give them those subsidies. You need to give them because they have the X factor, which others don't. And you have to remunerate them for X factor. But equally so, big government isn't the solution. We've not done anything in the last 30, 40 years for the health of poor Americans. And America says, so I'm going to end on a note and tell you how bad conditions really are. US has one of the largest economies in the world, spends the highest amount on healthcare per person of any country, 17% of GDP. Yet median age in US is eight to nine years lower than Germany and Japan. Median age in Japan is 49, in, is roughly 39 in US, nearly 10 years lower. Why? Because the poor people die off earlier. The richer people have access to the best health system, the best genomics, the best biotechnology. And post GFC inequality is increasing. Inequality is increasing in London too. It's increasing in Monaco. It's increasing in South Africa. It's increasing in India. So what scares me is youth unemployment is increasing in the world, and that could create the kind of Arab Spring that I talked about, and I predicted the Arab Spring just by looking at youth numbers in the Middle East. So that scares me. But educating people and looking at the world around, uh, sharing ideas with you is what keeps me going still. Emerging markets did not all have a demographic dividend. Brazil and Mexico, I wrote about why Brazil and Mexico didn't have the demographic dividend. Yet, Asian economies like Korea, like uh, Singapore and Malaysia, why did they have the demographic dividend? Because in Brazil, corruption, state greed, inequality, and poor health, poor education kept from delivering the demographic if you if you're bullish on one country in the world or one area based on your demographic framework where is it nordic countries and singapore singapore has the best health system in the world the best education system in the world yet they care about 
they are having debts and debts are happening in the kind of so-called ghettos of Indians and Sri Lankans and multi-scrapers who want to still congregate together because they are not as, I mean, so progress is happening across the generations in the Nordic countries because they realize that the old people need to do things for the young people. Proper social welfare state. They are renegotiating the pension promises. They are trying to still have a work-life balance where they don't work like the Americans do, just take two weeks of holidays and think that, yeah, you can accumulate a lot of money. So they are progressive. They can make changes. But the biggest changes are being made in two authoritarian countries. So either changes, meaningful changes are happening in homogeneous, very liberal educated countries, the Nordics and Singapore, or else changes are happening by the authoritarian rule in countries such as China and Russia. In democracies like India, in UK, fragile democracies, you don't have decision making. And that is a big problem. And we need to kind of think about how to create good decision making in countries where people will get good vote making. So in other words, the reason America is in the position it is, and I will end on this, is the octogenarians and the septogenarians, the people above 70 and 80, nearly 70 to 80 percent of them vote. People below 40, less than 30 percent vote. And so the voting power is all with the rich people. So one of my former students at Fidelity had a very easy answer to that. She said, closer you are to your end date, less your vote should count. And we wrote a, Google this, we wrote a very important report called Age of Responsibility. And this is uh, with pension consultants in UK. You may have heard of them. They are Reddington, along with the pensions and defense minister of UK, Lord Hunt, and a bunch of other companies, Dimensional, Schroders, etc. I wrote the first chapter where I said, people need to start saving 15% of GDP if you want to deal with aging. We cannot be in a society where we are spending a lot more. Answer is who will give us that additional money if GDP is not going up, if asset returns aren't going up. And unfortunately, we aren't in the decades of the 80s and 90s. The only people who can get that kind of return are the Elon Musks and the Peter Thiels or the people who invented things like Zoom. Yeah, complicated world. And now listen, thank you. Amazing to catch up with you. Uh, there's a lot to unpack in all of that. And Yeah, it's a pleasure being on your show. Thank stay you, in touch and hope to see you sometime when you're in London. Absolutely. Take okay. care, my friend. Okay. Bye. I hope you enjoyed this special episode of the interview, the premier business and finance series in the world. However, this is just the tip of the iceberg. For more in-depth content and expert analysis, visit the membership link in the description to unlock a week's access for only $1. This dollar can change your life.